So now uh, we need to prepare for our first panel. Um, chaired by uh, Jane Lindholm, would uh, those of you on the Real News Fake News panel please come down to the table here and uh, if you don't find a microphone right in front of you, share. Questions, hoping that you'll have concise, actual questions for our panel, um, which is such a, a wonderful panel today. The title of our discussion is Real News, Fake News, The Threats to News Integrity and the Ethics of Journalism. And before we get started, I just want to mention that as I've been listening to these remarks and looking up at the press box here, it's a little startling to see an almost empty press box. And I invite you to think about what that would feel like if there was no journalism core covering what's happening in the State House here, how different that would be for what you know about what's happening in Montpelier. So let me introduce our panel here today. It's a, a diverse group of voices. I'm really interested to hear what you have to say. And, and we'll start down here at this end. Alan Gilbert was executive director of the ACLU of Vermont from 2004 to 2016, which gives him an interesting perspective on the freedom of the press. But he also has experience as a working journalist, as a reporter and then city editor at the Rutland Herald, and as assistant editor of the Sunday Herald and Times Argus. And before that, he worked for communications and public policy research firms. Thank you here on the panel, Alan. Paul Heinz is a staff writer and political editor at Seven Days. Before starting at Seven Days, he worked at the News Hour with Jim Lehrer and Brattleboro Reformer. And he has also been on another side of the coin here in the journalism conversation as a staffer with Congressman Peter Welch. Jane Mayer is a staff writer for The New Yorker and author of several books of investigative and narrative journalism. She's reported on how Russia influenced the 2016 election, the role billionaires have played in elevating the far right, about Anita Hill, and about Brett Kavanaugh accuser Deborah Ramirez. She's also a significant target for people who want to discredit her writing. When I Googled Jane Mayer fake news yesterday to see what maybe she's been saying about this, the first result, the very first result that pops up is a headline that reads, more fake news from Jane Mayer and The New Yorker, and starts with the line, Jane Mayer is a failed reporter for The New Yorker who's tried to make a career out of smearing Charles and David Koch. So there you go. <laughs> David Motes was editorial page editor for the Rutland Herald for 25 years, winning the Pulitzer Prize for original editorial writing in 2001. His 2004 book, Civil Wars, A Vow for Gay Marriage, explored the national scene just as Massachusetts became the first state to legalize same-sex marriage and became a bible for a lot of people looking at the same-sex marriage debate as it unfolded many years later. And uh, John Mark Oles is political columnist for BT Digger. He's an author. He formerly worked as a columnist and national political correspondent for the Chicago Tribune. It's a pleasure to have you here today, too. So I want to start out by asking the biggest question, or maybe the most um, pointed provocative question. You know, fake news can mean different things to different people. There's actual fake news that's out there, a ton of it. There are half-truths, total fakeries, opinion that's passed off as fact. So actual fake news in the sense that it is not truthful. It is not journalism. And then there's journalism, facts, reporting that's being delegitimized by one side or the other, but most notably from the political right, led by President Donald Trump, who spreads falsehoods about news stories that he doesn't like. It may seem that we should all know the difference between fake news and real news, between opinion and fact, between editorializing and investigative journalism. And I think sometimes journalists think, come on, it's easy. But I'm actually not sure it is. And I wonder if our panel thinks that we're in a time of crisis for journalism. John, you all <laughs> Well, I'm always reluctant to declare a crisis. Uh, there's clearly a problem. Um, my understanding is that the term fake news began in the night, was invented in the 1930s, and someone said it sounds more authentic in the original German. Um, the, 
And, but it did have a precise meaning in 2016. It meant stuff that people just made up sitting in some, uh, in Kazakhstan or something like that. And they would make up stuff that they didn't care whether, whether it was true. And they didn't even care what the political impact was. They apparently were making money by writing stuff that said something like the Pope had endorsed Donald Trump. It now seems to mean anything that President Trump does like, and I think you have to give him credit for quite brilliantly changing the definition for his political advantage, and people now just call whatever they don't like fake news. And I think before we get too defensive about this, and we should be, we should be defensive about our real honorable calling, there are a lot of mistakes. And there are, and we often hit the flaw of, of having assumption, of, of, of basing our, our stories on some assumptions that are questionable, that are debatable, even if they're not one. So we sometimes confuse absolutely verifiable fact with, oh, it's probably true because it, it fits this, uh, it, it fits my overall world view. So, that's a bit of a danger that we have to be wary of. Thank you. Jane. So I, I think um, one thing that's that, that's in past times that we've always assumed is that the truth will come out and that our good works will um, speak for itself, and that we don't really need to defend the truth and point out the lies in a big way. It's, we have the First Amendment, everybody has a right to speak, and I think what's happened is we've reached a point where I think the truth has to get louder. I think we now have to call out lies more. We have, um, um, as somebody, Jonathan Rash wrote a piece recently about how we used to just sort of laugh at baloney, but now we have a baloney factory in the White House. And so we actually have to call it out more. That's become part of our job. And I think it's, it's, it's very important that we try to separate it out and we try to say what's true, what are lies. We kind of have to bust the liars more, including the president when he's lying. And I think, um, you know, we've got to also push back on the, on the social media platforms that spread lies. And that's become one of our biggest problems. And I'll give you an example. Um, right now, we all know that there's a lot of talk about this caravan of migrants that's moving towards the United States and supposedly causing great, you know, opposing a great threat to us. And there's a photograph that's been spread all over social media of, of, of a, a policeman with a bloodied face that supposedly took on this, this caravan and got beat up. And, and that, that photograph turns out to have been from 2012. It has nothing to do with this. I know that groups and, and, and various press advocates who called Facebook, pushed back, said stop letting people circulate that phony picture. That is actual fake news. Um, it's inflammatory. Um, one of the Supreme Court justices' wives Clarence Thomas' wife has spread that particular photograph all over the internet. Uh, people have tried to ask her to stop. They have neither have stopped. Um, Facebook hasn't cracked down on it. Jenny Thomas hasn't stopped. Um, these are um, Im important points, sort of inflection points, where I think those of us who are interested in the truth have to call it out and demand that we defend our own institutions and we defend um, accuracy in the in the press. Uh, so. If I could add to that, I think not only I think not only do we need to uh, perhaps speak louder, um, we also need to show our work when we can. I think that's one way where we can um, build rebuild credibility with our audiences. And this is something that um, I've heard Eric Lipton in the New York Times, the UVM alum. Uh, talk about something he's done with his work. A lot of his work is very much based on uh, documents that he's obtained through uh, public records requests. And he is very diligent about posting every single document that informs the story so that his audience can see that uh, and know that he is not 
not that he would, but he is not fabricating um, any of this information. David Farenkel in the Washington Post did this famously during the 2016 election when he um, was reporting about the charities that uh, President Trump, or then nominee Trump, um, had ostensibly donated to, or his foundation donated to. Farenkel um, kept a notebook, an old-fashioned notebook, um, and wrote the names of each of the organizations he called, um, and he would tweet out a photograph of that notebook um, constantly. Uh, and I think it really showed his audience, this is not just some guy who's out to get Donald Trump, this is a guy who's um, doing his work and uh, showing his work. Um, if I could get back just very briefly to the, uh, the, the notion of fake news, and I think that uh, Mr. Margolis framed it very well, it's a, a term that used to have meaning, um, and now means the opposite of that meaning. Um, I, you know, I think when a word means everything, it means nothing at all. Um, and I think it is, is rendered useless. Um, and I think that, um, you know, with all due respect to the people who play on this conference, um, I don't think we should be spending a whole lot of time uh, throwing around the word fake news and uh, using this term, uh, because I think it has been demagogued. Um, and we're seeing the results of that uh, more and more every day in, in more and more dangerous ways. It's not just Donald Trump saying it um, at, you know, the White House lecture. It's authoritarians across the globe uh, who are um, using that term to disparage uh, the really important journalism that, that it's done uh, at, at great risk and at great cost. So, uh, you know, I, I think it is good to talk about things um, like this that are challenging, but um, we shouldn't all the time try to uh, discuss this word in this term, because I think it, it really um, is problematic. Paul uh, and David, I, I want to, you can comment on that if you'd like to, but I, um, Paul brought up this question of trust and showing your work, verifying uh, where it came from, having some transparency. But we've also noticed, especially in the national press, and especially since the uh, election of Donald Trump, that there's been a lot of anonymous sourcing in national stories. And I, I'm curious, Alan, maybe you have a perspective on this as well, about how that fits into the question of transparency, trust, honesty. If you don't know who the source is, is that more difficult for readers to trust and be able to verify what they're reading in the press? Well, I, th I think the immediate answer to that is yes, obviously. But, you know, I think embedded in this conversation is a sense that fake news is new. And I think the very opposite is true. You know, if I, I've been reading a lot of history since 2016, trying to figure out what's happened. And there's a lot of great new history books that have come out recently that try to, try to look at currents in American history and politics that have been there forever, but ebb and flow. And one of the currents that has been there, I mean, literally, from some of the first presidential elections in this country is fake news. I mean, the election of 1796, which was the very hotly contested election between Jefferson and Adams, when it comes to truth, it was a disaster. I mean, the, 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 press, the press was partisan. It was nothing but partisan. The same was true in the election of uh, 1800. It was true in the election of 1828 when uh, Andrew Jackson got elected. So I, I think we have to get away from the notion that, that, that fake news is something that's new. It's not. It's almost baked into our politics. The newspaper name, Free Press, by the way, Free Press was originally a paper that was free of partisan political attachments. It wasn't referring to First Amendment rights, it was referring to a newspaper that was trying to give a balanced view to the news that was going on. And it, it came about in the 1830s and 1840s as national journalism grew up in New York. The one thing that is new, and I think we all know this, but we haven't thought about it enough and we need to do much more. And the thing that's new is digital communications. And there are three important things about digital communications that we're still trying to understand. The first is just the fact that something is digital. You no longer have to have an alphabet of 26 letters, you have bits and bytes, you know, you've got a binary system. The second is the easy distribution of information. One of the things that means that everybody is a reporter and everybody is a printer. We all have a printing press available to us 24 seven and we have access to the entire world. No news source has ever had that opportunity. 
The third thing that we also don't think about, but is incredibly important, and that is how cheap digital memory has become. I forget the, the, the exact number, I used to know this off, off the top of my head, but in 2000, a megabyte of um, memory cost something like uh, $500,000 to produce. By 2016, the cost was down to two cents. What this has meant is that any information that's created is hardly ever destroyed or deleted. And it's because it's actually more expensive to delete information now, to go through it and figure out what you should be deleting, than it is to keep it. You just put it on the cloud or on some big server, and it exists forever. Information that exists forever, I think we can all imagine how that can be used. So I think we're grappling with something that we understand and we don't understand, but we're still dealing with a lot of the same circumstances, in this case, fake news. I think uh, the crisis is not so much one of journalism as it is of our, our culture and uh, uh, the fact that uh, the, we have the, the digital communications that we have now has flooded our culture with information so that uh, the problem is not so much that certain voices are not heard as it is that there is such a cacophony of voices people have a hard time figuring out what to believe. Um, David Mendich's speech about Vermont and how uh, uh, Vermont is a small community allowing for journalism to thrive and politics to be wholesome was, is inspiring in a way but also uh, kind of uh, alarming in a way because most of the country is not Vermont. And so the sense of community that we have here does not uh, prevail so much elsewhere. And I always like to think of um, uh, uh, the, the fact that in, in judging journalism, we have to use common sense and sort of our, our human judgment. As if, you know, you're sitting at a bar and someone next to you starts to tell you stuff. You use your judgment about whether, whether this person knows what he's talking about or whether, uh, or, uh, you, you judge the person, you judge the information, if, uh, and, and you have, in order to sort of make up your own mind, you don't just take his word for it, and, but stuff comes in on the internet, and I think, I mean, a sex ring and a pizza joint in Maryland, uh, that sort of thing, uh, if that's flooding the um, media environment, then we have a problem, and, um, and uh, you know, we as journalists do what we can to to uh, to provide good information and real stories and 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 context and so on. Uh, but um, it's a struggle, and um, you know, we as journalists also use our own judgments, judging our own sources, whom whom to believe in, in out there um, in the journalism world, and so. Um, I guess I'm partly encouraged by the fact that uh, the journalism community has risen up to the challenge of this new era, but it's a challenge. Oh, oh, no, I mean, I, I agree with all of these. And, um, no, I, was, I, I think, though, <clears throat> and, and, well, and, and of course, Alan is, is right about the history that there's, there's always been you know, and, and, and as Paul said, there, there is, there's always been a, you know, challenge that, that some of the press is faking it or that, you know, each other's facts are wrong and that kind of thing. But I think what's different at this point is, um, is that I think what's coming out of the White House anyway is an effort to try to undermine the idea that there is such a thing as the truthful press because there's kind of a struggle going on about who gets to tell the truth and whose truth is going to win. And you've got a government, um, a head of a government, tr that's trying to delegitimize the whole idea of the fourth estate, really. Um, not just by saying they're fake, but by saying they're enemies of the people, by saying that they're, you know, craven or whatever. I don't know that he uses that word. It might not be in his vocabulary, but, um, but, <laughs> but he's got other words. But the idea is that and it's, it's an assault not just on the fourth estate, really, but I think what's 
worrisome to me anyway is it's, it's an attack on a whole method of finding the truth in our democracy. It's a, it's a process that it, he's attacking things like the Congressional Budget Office, which comes up with statistics that are reliable. He's attacking science um, that um, comes up with warnings about things like climate change. Um, it, it's, it's, these are, these are um, truths that are peer-reviewed, that are um, facts that are checked in places like The New Yorker and all of your news organizations where we bend over backwards to get both sides. It's a method of trying to find the truth um, in a fair-minded way. And, um, and what we're seeing, I think, that worries me is, a, is, an, is an attack on that methodology, which really is, in a way, in the basis, it's the methodology of the Enlightenment. And he's saying, no, I've got the power to tell you what the truth is. And, and your methods aren't valid. And that's a big problem. Is it just the president? Well, I, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it's Kellyanne Conway when she came out and said there are alternative facts when you're describing the size of a, of a inaugural um, gathering and you can see the aerial photographs that show a small crowd versus a large one. And she's saying, don't believe your eyes, believe my alternative facts, and um, don't believe the aerial photographs. It's, 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 a, it's, 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 you know, it's, a, it's a way of thinking that's delegitimizing um, um, a, a process of Western civilization. Western civilization, <laughs> just that. Yeah, right, because, just a, well, so. I, 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 exactly correct. It's not so much, people talk about the president lies. I'm always very reluctant to call a person a liar because I can't call it to someone else's head and know what the person knows when, when he or she says something that's false. Mr. Trump challenges that disinclination whether it's ever been challenged. But more important is he and some others, and there's a little bit of this over on the left side of the political spectrum, but much less, less visible and much less dangerous right now, to uh, challenge the whole idea that there is such a thing as empirically verifiable truth. And that the way to just to uh, determine what that truth is, is to gather actual evidence, data, relevant experience, etc., and filter that uh, information through the rational part of your life, through reason. The guys who put our country together lived in what later became known as the age of reason because they kind of figured all this out and, and figured out you didn't have, what was true was not what the king or the priest said was true, but what, what each of us could determine ourselves using information and rationality. And that seems to be an issue right? and in, in danger. And you cannot have a democracy uh, without conversation, and you cannot have conversation without at least some agreement on what fact is and how you can determine it. I mean, I think in some way we can call this, this uh, threat to the very idea of verifiable fact, that light on America. Because if you can't have a democracy, we can't have the same country that we've had. It. And, and I think that is even more important. We should be part of that ration. That's what we do. We check everything out. As Jane said, in Chicago, the motto was, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. And, and you don't take anything on face value because of somebody's alleged authority, filter it through evidence and reason. And we have to keep, and Paul's right, we have to not only keep doing that, we have to show people that we're doing that. I think if I could just uh, jump in on this, the other, uh, I think, challenge of the Trump administration is that, uh, you know, presidents come and go, um, or at least they have in the past. Um, <laughs> and, but what I really worry about is the permission structure that uh, President Trump has created for others um, in civic life um, to, to engage in a similar um, truth denying. And I think we, we already see this in congressional politics. We see candidates um, for the House and for the Senate um, you know, taking a similar approach to truth. Um, we saw it in um, the Brett Kavanaugh fight. We saw that with uh, Roy Moore's candidacy. Um, we see, you know, any number of examples of um, uh, politicians seeing some opportunity in just plowing ahead 
um, regardless of truth and regardless of facts. Um, and so, and, and, and I see it filtering down even, even here in Vermont where everything's perfect. Um, you know, just in the last couple of days, I, um, I wrote a story uh, and, you know, one of the first comments, never read the comments, very important <laughs> principle, but I made a mistake, I read one of the comments and, and uh, it's, it was something along the lines of, uh, this story is fake news because of X, you know. And I, I am all for people challenging my stories and correcting me when I'm wrong and pushing back, back on uh, my conclusions, but uh, the, the manner in which this person dismissed uh, the story I thought was a little bit alarming. And, and this was a Vermont, uh, so I mean, we are not dangerous at all. It's as if information in some quarters is no longer information, it's a weapon. And it doesn't matter if it's true or false. You know, if Clarence Thomas' wife is disseminating this phony photo, I'm, I assume she knows it's phony. She's been told that it's phony, but she doesn't care because it's a weapon to be used in the political struggle. Uh, and and uh, uh, good uh, progressive-minded liberals don't like to engage in that kind of thing. So you know, uh, in a way. Uh, they may feel they have one hand tied behind their back because they they are not resorting to falsehood, or at least they think they shouldn't. And um, so that just means uh, journalists and uh, have to do have as as Jane says, it has to, have to fight back with the truth. But journalists fighting back with the truth, if people don't believe that journalists are truthful to begin with. You know, they're, they're not going to trust your sourcing. You know, they're not going to trust what you're saying because they fundamentally don't trust you. And I, and, and I, you know, I don't mean to suggest that that's how everybody feels, but these smart people, you know, people who are trying to keep abreast of information, there are so many sources out there. There are so many ways to find news and so many people you trust who get falsehoods, who pass them along, and you don't know whether to trust the person that you think is right or trust a media organization or know why you should trust that media organization. But I think it is more difficult these days for people even to know whether what's real is real, whether what you say is real, you tell me you've, you've found the facts. How do I know? You know? How do I know what you're saying is right? I think there is this swirling cacophony, as you put it, that makes it difficult for people to sift through what they know to be true and what they know to be false, and who they should trust to tell them that they're telling the truth. So how does journalism, rather than you know doing it for other journalists or doing it for the people we think are smart enough to know that we're right, you know how does does that truth disseminate these days? Well, I mean, I think Paul's right, that, and that we have to be transparent, and and we have to correct our mistakes. We all make mistakes. Um, all of us can be off on any given day and, and you know it, it, part of being honest is acknowledging that and, and correcting the record um, but I actually think having been lucky enough to have come out of um, a career that started in the Vermont media first for the Weathersfield Weekly the smallest weekly in the state of Vermont and then at the Rutland Herald um, where I had Alan Gilbert as an editor, and Stephen Terry as an editor, and Kendall Wilde, um, that, that, that really one of the important answers is local news. That we, because when you're at the same school board meeting or you know whatever meeting or just out in the community, they know you're not fake. They know the news is not fake. You're part of the community. And, and I think one of the great, you know, problems is that, that the, the economics of local news have kind of fallen apart. And, and, and in many states, there are no state house reporters now. Um, and so, which is a, t a t terrible thing. So I think, you know, trying to figure out things like BT Digger and Seven Days and ways to revive local news is a way to build trust. And um, and Vermont's so lucky that it's that it, and and if you are truly um, so many great organizations up here, um, and I think it's those of us who are sort of now in the national, you know, brawl that that are really distrusted the most probably, uh, and hopefully we don't deserve it. At least not every day. Yeah, I I wanted to say I, I think one thing. Another very 
long historical trend in this country is anti-intellectualism. And the fact in, in the 50s, I think it was, that American historian Richard Hofstadter wrote a book called Anti-Intellectualism in American Life. And I, th I think one of the things we're seeing now is, be is, again, because of the internet, I think the inherent anti-intellectualism that flourishes in this country and is part of our historical tradition, and some might say the reason we were so quick to start common schools, public education in this country, was a lot of people distrust authority, which I think most of us would kind of applaud, I would. But they also distrust science. There's almost sometimes a, a, a reverie that, that, that is occasioned by distrusting what science tells us might be happening. The big difference between, excuse me, when this paper came out, this is, this is one of my favorite papers from November 20th, 1976. And I like it not only because it has a picture of Patty Hearst in, in the middle here, but it also has a story called Newspaperless Error Told at Dartmouth. Kevin, who is the president of Dartmouth, tells editors, computer is their successor. When you look at this paper... Alan wrote the story, I should Yeah, well, that's what I mean, look how big this thing is. I open it up, look at this. I have to hold my hands out. And it's got advertisements. It's got stories jammed in here. It also has... This paper had a heck of a lot of curators behind it. There were a lot of gatekeepers who were involved every step of the way before this, paper, before this paper actually came off the press and was distributed around Vermont. If, again, think of the internet, and there basically are no editors for all those people who are reporters out there. You know, basically, if you're on Facebook, you're a reporter. If you give information on Facebook, you are a reporter. And reporters used to have certain responsibilities in how they wrote about the news, investigated the news, reported it. And then the editors who were in charge of watching the reporters also had certain responsibilities. So there, there was a curated product that came out that I would say had inherent veracity to it. At least that was the assumption at the time. But, but isn't there a problem, I'm sorry, no, I have to interrupt there. I mean, isn't there a problem when, I mean, how many of those curators of this newspaper were white men, you know, sure. probably all of them. Right. And I think that um, while there's a real danger, I guess, or there can be a danger in the cacophony that David described earlier, um, there are some real, real good things that come out of that. I mean, just think about the Black Lives Matter movement. I don't think that could possibly have come to fruition if it weren't for people's ability to post videos of police violence um, themselves on their own platforms. And police violence is, I mean, not new, racism is not new, it's just all of a sudden people who have not been at the you know, helm of newspapers were able to tell these stories. Right. And I, I'd say, you know, white men, except one exception, have been who has been president of this country for the last 200 plus years. Um, that's not to defend the way that white men have interacted <laughs> with all of us in uh, American society, but the difference, the, the difference is the technology, I think, that's available. And technology, technology is valueless. Technology itself does not have an inherent value. It's what's made of the technology that produces values. And I agree, I think it's great to have all sorts of technologies available to all of us now to access more information and produce more information. But I think we're still grappling with the fact that all of us really have become observers and reporters, whether we think of ourselves in that way or not. And that is completely different. Um, Maybe that's very the price powerful. we pay. Maybe the price we pay for a decentralization of the news media and the ability for other voices to have not only a platform, but sometimes a megaphone to speak, is you have all of these voices. And so figuring out and filtering becomes much more difficult. So do we need to be teaching media literacy? I mean, is there some yes, we do. skill we that people need? Yes, we do. Yes, in some place. I think Susan Stonebrook has got a whole uh, 
uh, kind of program in media liter literacy, and it's being done in some other places. I wanted to say one thing based on Alan talked about science, and that's true. It, I think we're, the surveys I've seen have shown that most people don't think we're doing things. Most people still trust the mainstream media, print, TV, somewhat less cable, and I don't know about the uh, internet, uh, online stuff. But, but a substantial minority does not trust us, and I would liken it to that substantial minority that does not believe in human created global warming. It's even, a, I think, somewhat larger minority, but it's still, it's still a minority, but it's, it's, it's quite large considering the obvious scientific evidence. And I think one reason for that is that, these, that some people find the people who started telling them about global warming 30 years ago and still telling, still telling them about it, a pain in the neck, annoying, condescending, even a little obnoxious. And that colors their, uh, it's hard to believe a person you find unpleasant. I know this because, I mean, as a guy who likes an occasional cigar, I find the anti-smoking zealots really obnoxious. They're right, of course. But, but, it's, <laughs> but it's hard to make that, you know, a lot of people can't make that distinction. If I don't like you, you're wrong. I think we come across that way sometimes, individuals and maybe in the aggregate, and it's hard not to, because you're supposed to know more than your readers about whatever you're writing about or talking about. So there is a certain amount of explanation. I'm explaining to you. There's a little bit of eat your spinach involved in much of what we do. We have to be careful about the way we do it so we don't come off as a bunch of prints. I want to make sure we leave some time for audience questions, so I want to just pose one more question before we, we take it to the full uh, chamber here. And, you know, this is a question that certainly preoccupies me and preoccupies a lot of journalists these days, and that is the question of the value of objectivity. What do you think in this era where we talk about trustworthiness, we're talking about information, verification, What's the value, or is there still a value, in journalistic objectivity? And I don't mean the view from nowhere. Jay Rosen's famous phrase that, you know, there's sort of false equivalency. Well, one side says this, and one side says this, and I don't know, you make up your mind. I don't mean that, but there seems to be a push, and certainly in younger generations especially, to include your perspective, and not just to interrogate your perspective before you write your article, but to include it as part of the piece, how I feel about this, how my political views have shaped this, that that's important to the, to the piece. And I'm curious what, what all of you think about this long-held tenet of objectivity. Well, so I, I, after leaving Vermont, I went to first to Washington and, and, and then the Wall Street Journal in New York, where not only were you supposed to be objective, but you were the rule was you were never allowed to start a sentence that began with I unless the rest of the sentence was, was shot in the groin. <laughs> so, we were told we were not the story. Um, and so that was, and, and I, I mean, I, I, in the, just to take the, the Kavanaugh coverage recently, I was writing about a woman named Deborah Ramirez, who was a classmate of the Kavanaugh's at Yale. And, uh, I, it, we, I was working with Ronan Farrow, and we, he interviewed her, and we went out of our way, I did, to also reach Kavanaugh, who wasn't speaking, but his lawyer was, and to reach the White House, and to say to them, do you have any reason to think that Deborah Ramirez is lying? You don't just take, you know, you don't just side with somebody because she's telling her story. You go to the other side and say, do you think she's lying? And they said, well, you need to talk to X, Y, and Z who knew her. And I did. And I said to them, do you think she's lying? Nobody said she was lying. They, they, were, the other, they were Kavanaugh's witnesses. They were there to, to cut down Deborah Ramirez. They said they didn't know her to be a liar. They didn't think she had political motivations. So I said, well, what do you, you know, is there some reason I should distrust what she's saying? And the best they could come up with was she'd never mentioned it before, which I put in the story. 
But, I, you know, this business of making sure to talk to all sides, whether or not you're objective, you're trying to provide people with the complete spectrum of points of view in a story. And you're trying to do it fairly and accurately. That's what it's about. And whether or not I have a point of view on it, my job is, is you know, like, a, like any other professional, is to get, get the whole picture in there. Um, and I think that's still very important. I think uh, objectivity is what we pursue. We're, ne we're never uh, uh, always perfectly godlike in, in our objectivity, but it's a goal, it's an aim. Uh, and I know there's a, a, a trend towards reporters admitting their own biases in the story. Well, the story is not necessarily about the reporter. And it, the reporter needs to be aware of his biases, but, and, and not let that get in the way of the search for objectivity and what, what Jane is talking about. Um, so uh, I, I think objectivity is, maybe it's not the right word, but you know, the full picture is what, what we're after. I cling, perhaps I've become an anachronism, I cling to the belief that there's a, a real importance in what I prefer to call the journalism of the disinterested observer. I'm not on anybody's team. My late friend, Jerome Holtzman, the Tribune's great baseball writer, didn't coin or popularize the phrase, there's no cheering in the press box. Uh, we watch the game. We supposedly understand it better than most people. There's an argument about that. Um, we wear a tag around our neck that lets us go out onto the field during batting practice and into the clubhouse after the game. We don't root for anybody. And I think what Jane, the process Jane just described, reporters doing that work, getting all, getting uh, input from all sides of every controversy and being straight and honest about it, whether or not they have an opinion, I have to tell you, for the most part, I don't have very many strong opinions. I cover this chamber. They talk about the minimum wage, family leave, get people all upset. Frankly, it doesn't, you know, I don't have very strong opinions about that. But even if I did, I could do the job of the, and go through that process that Jane just described with her and what she did on this one story. And you can still do that and you don't have to. I'm, I'm not important. Um, and I think we're not important. Democracy is important. What we are. Is, is the proxy for the average person who, who has work to do and children to uh, raise and dishes to do and they can't spend their time hanging around state houses and thinking about this stuff and we do that for them. John, I, you, while you may not have opinions, you definitely have biases and you have life experiences that shape the way that you see the world and write about the world, as do I, as, as do we all. Um, and I think that's, you know, it's important we need to be honest with ourselves that we do bring all of that to our profession. We try to, um, you know, perhaps compensate for um, those biases, or at least be honest with them, be honest about them with our editors um, and when appropriate with our readers. Um, but you know, as David said, I totally agree. It's you know, objectivity is something to strive for, something that we'll never actually achieve um, unless you know we are fully become computers, as President Kennedy, I guess. Uh, Predicted, but I think this is another reason why um, competition is really important in the press as well, and um, and this goes to the, the idea of media literacy. Um, if you're getting all of your news from John Margolis, that's a problem. I'm not because John isn't great at what he does, but we need we need to hear from other people as well. And you know, um, no doubt. Especially <laughs> uh, But you know, no doubt, John reads. You know, how many news sources do you think you read in a given month? Probably several. Probably more than several. More than several. Um, and I think that's something that we need to be teaching as well. That we, we cannot rely on any one news organization. That's why we need to have many news organizations. And um, just to respond to something that someone said earlier about the importance of collaboration um, in the Vermont uh, uh, news media, there is a big role for competition as well. And if we're all um, publishing the same material um, and we're all producing it centrally, uh, then that means fewer people in those committee rooms um, trying to beat the other to the scoop. Um, so I think, I think we can't lose sight of that as well. 
Let's open that floor up to any questions that you might have, especially questions for our panelists given the work that they do and what they've been saying. And I, I may repeat it so that it goes into the microphone for the recordings, but go right ahead. Um, so as young journalists, we have sort of a, a duty to report the news as, as you guys do as, as professional journalists that have been doing this a long time. Um, and I think um, what young, especially digital journalists will do uh, is use like clickbaity titles or things that sort of grab the reader with 10 or so words. Um, do you think that has any bearing on how we should um, think about the titles of our news? Should we, should we stray away from those clickbait titles or can we use them to our advantage? So question and paraphrase from a, a young journalist and especially thinking about um, digital journalism and thinking about what should you be doing as a young journalist, this question of getting uh, clickbait through your titles, having a really catchy title to get people to your story and how much that might be contributing to um, an exaggeration or this sort of heightened sense of, you know, clickbaity, get, guess what happened, you'll never guess, and then you click on it. What, what should we be doing? <laughs> we, even uh, old-fashioned newspaper guys and women would resort, would try for catchy, colorful headlines uh, and leads in their stories. We, we, you know, we have a sense of humor. We, we like a funny headline, uh, 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 but we don't want to distort or blow up or, or sensationalize. It, there's a fine line, you know, you, your, he, your, he, your headline, you want to draw readers in. There's nothing wrong with that. But being dishonest about it, that would not be so great. There's a, there's a scene in the movie, The Front Page, in which the reporter is telling the editor what's in his story, and the editor says, well, what about this other element? The reporter says, that's in the second paragraph. The editor says, nobody reads the second paragraph. And one of my goals every time I write a story is to get somebody, everybody to read the second paragraph, because who knows, some of them may go on and read the third and fourth. That means you have to make the first paragraph interesting. So there's always been a bit of a showbiz element here. Can I just say, notice the huge difference there is in applying a click to something like this, choosing a story to read, and your question. I mean, click comes from the click you make with a mouse when you're choosing what to do on your computer. You have thousands of options almost every time you make the first click to, to launch a program, right? When you look at this paper, you don't have those options. You have, I don't know, uh, maybe 35 options here of stories, let's say. So I think what's happened is you've been forced into a situation that is being applied to the work you do because of the nature of the technology. You have to grab attention. You have to get somebody to click your story as opposed to thousands of other stories that might be on your news site or other news sites. And that puts you in a very different position than somebody who was writing headlines for the Rutland Herald in 1976. I'll just chime in here as well um, from VPR perspective. We uh, workshop every headline on our website before it goes out. And actually, it gives me heartburn to think about them sometimes because as Paul was talking about perspective, and your own biases and where you come from, the headline you write can be the first thing that conveys a story to your audience. And that perspective, whether you're saying about someone, you know, victim of crime was liked by many versus victim of crime was a drug dealer. You know, what are you choosing to convey? And, and the headline itself, I think, can be a very important marker of your own biases, your own perspective, and what you're choosing to convey and can be very, very wrong unintentionally. So, you know, I think it's a, I think headlines are a difficult thing. We have time for one more question. Oh, that awful. One of the most fascinating things that's happening in the press today is the, the people are at the borders. Those, you know, the people coming up on the borders. Every newscast, even the PBS to Fox, the first thing they show are all these thousands of people at the border. This is the main thing being used by Trump to, to play to the base, to increase the fear. Every, every day, he just talks about these people coming from the border. The responsibility for the people who are showing this is to tell the people that, first of all, they're 1,500 miles away. 
They're nowhere near the American border. They don't make this clear. Every, every, every time we see it, it looks like they're coming over the border of the United States. That's not true. And Trump is using it as if they're coming over the border of the United States. So the responsibility I'm saying to the press uh, is to show and be clear to the people that these people are not coming over the American border right now. They're 1,500 miles away. And uh, why, why don't they make that clearer? In the news. So one of the questions is uh, speaking specifically about an issue right now with the, what's being called the migrant caravan uh, in, in currently in Mexico. It's a, a political point being made by Trump right now about you want to protect our borders. This, this migrant caravan is coming here. But if they're not here, if they're not coming, what's the responsibility of the journalist, especially if all people are looking at is the headline and the picture? to get a broader picture and to get a better perspective on, on what the truth is, to have more nuance and more um, more truth on that. That's what you're looking at. I, I, I mean, this is a problem where we, you know, we, you have to be wary of being manipulated, but you also can't ignore the message completely coming out of the, the White House. Um, I thought, um, uh, Public Radio did a great job this morning as I was dri driving over here. They had an interview with the Dartmouth professor who was talking about um, immigrants and what they do for the economy. And it put the whole question of immigration in context and, and provided facts that surprisingly said, actually immigration is a net plus for the U.S. economy. Immigration both of unskilled laborers and skilled laborers. And, the stories it doing making that effort, trying to find um, some some sort of quiet facts, I think is a tremendous service. I think most of the reports that I've seen on that story, people do maybe they don't maybe they should put it in a, higher up in their story or in their report. But I haven't. I think people do make that point that they're quite a ways away and they're walking. They're well, it depends if you're watching Fox. Well, I should. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> too shabby. <shit. laughs> about whether the press has been, maybe has been, unfairly critical of Trump. You know, uh, when he made that comment at the, in the meeting with Putin, immediately the man was a traitor. Okay, and there's a bunch of other things like that. And I just wonder if you ever ask yourself, you know, maybe we are a little too opposition to him. The question is, is the press perhaps too oppositional, too critical of President Trump? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think uh, it's fine for the, the chief applause here. Um, no, I, I think I think the press is holding him accountable. What, what I do think, Guy, though, is that um, we uh, we and, and well, like more national reporters can be um, unfair to uh, the president's supporters. Um, and, and the, you know, millions and millions and millions of people who voted for him and continue to support him. Um, I think that's, that's an area where we could do better. Um, and I think this kind of goes back to the point that I've made a couple times now about, uh, about our biases. And, and one of them is an urban-rural bias, right? I mean, the vast majority of our um, journalists in this country are um, stationed in Washington, D.C. And, and New York City. Um, and, and, and even in Vermont, I mean, we have the same problem at a, at a smaller level, but it's still there. Um, you know, and we hear that at seven days occasionally, um, that you know, we're the voice of, Chit of Chittenden County, right? Um, so I think that we need to really um, do a better job of, of uh, respecting Trump's voters. But no, I think, I think the press has done a pretty good job of addressing the president. I would answer, oh, go ahead. So I was just gonna say, I think that's such a great point because if we're too much in our own bubble, we miss big stories, including most of the press and most of the country, and really Trump himself, were all surprised at the outcome in 2016 because I think a lot of us were out of touch with what was bubbling up in the way of anger out in the country or, or um, so I think, I mean, anyway, good, uh, great point. We've got to understand what's happening in the people, even if we can't have to say nice things about the president. I, I agree with both uh, Paul and Jane there, but I, I would answer Guy's question sometimes, and I'll give you one example. The Times, in, during the campaign, I think, had a story that said Trump had had five draft deferments. 
That's true. He had had five draft deferments. I had four. If you're old enough and you were a, a male, an able-bodied male when there was a draft and going to college, you got a deferment every year you were in college. It was a great incentive not to drop out. His fifth one with the fallen arches, you could raise some questions about, especially since the arches seemed to unfold soon thereafter. But, you know, and this was just a question of, apparently no one at the time was old enough to have remembered that we all got draft deferments uh, when, we, when you went to college. So there is some. Jane, can I make one final, final, final uh, off-topic point? I apologize uh, for doing this, but we've been talking a lot about the darkness out there um, in, in the media, and especially as far as in the way that the government um, deals with the media. But I think there was a real uh, moment of brightness that happened here in Vermont um, last year when the Vermont legislature um, and Governor Scott uh, passed and then signed uh, one of the strongest media shield laws in the country. This is Vermont. Um, had, had no protections for journalists uh, to essentially um, allow them to protect their confidential sources. This is something that Alan fought for for years. Um, and I think um, in part because of the Trump era, um, legislators uh, reacted swiftly and, and last, I think, April or May voted almost unanimously uh, uh, for the strongest media, one of the strongest media shield laws in the country. I want, there are a few of the lawmakers here who voted for that, so if you could just raise your hand, I think we should all recognize them for uh, not treating the press the way that uh, the president does. So, yeah. raise your hand. We could clearly talk about all of this stuff um, all day, but we will make room for the next panel. And I, I think many of us, if not all of us, will be around at lunch. So if you want to carry on this conversation and incorporate what we hear in other panels, we'd love to continue talking. Thanks very much to our panel today.